Thank you, Charles. We get started early today, Charles. <laughs> We're glad everybody's here today. We hope that thus far in your holiday season that things are going well for you. And you're getting all your decorations up and all your gifts bought and you've figured out what your grandkids want. That's the hardest part. But we hope it's going well. I think we should just forego the Sunday school lesson and let these members of George's family come and roast him. I think that'd be a whole lot more fun. You want to start? Yeah. That, that'd be a good thing to get a documentary on, Jim. Uh, so, you know. It's rolling. Not to plant a seed. But we're glad everyone's here. And I think we've, uh, I think the uh, Jim and Tracy and and, and Kitty and Nick for all the work that they did for this wonderful Christmas party. I thought that was one of the best ones we'd ever had. I thought the music was great, and you all were in good tune. And, uh, that, that lady, Miss Santa Claus, that, that was kind of different. I, and so if you don't know what that's about, you might check that out at, uh, out at some point. That, that, that was at the very minimum, very, very interesting. That lady's gotta have a backstory, but, and, but uh, we won't go there. But at any rate, thank you all very much for all that you did to make this uh, make this possible. And I certainly appreciate the gift that you gave me this year. Um, sometimes I think that if you'd get me an exercise machine instead of something to buy clothes with, I could get into that closet full of clothes and stuff. But I'll figure that one out. That's my New Year's resolution for about the... I don't know, 30 or 40. <laughs> I bet I bet I have I bet I have lost three or four thousand pounds. <laughs> I just tend to kind of reclaim it. From but how many have you gained? <laughs> Pardon me, Charles. I said, but how many have you gained? While you it's kind of like I had a guy tell me the other night we were at a, a business party at Chattanooga Golf and Country Club, and he said, on these grounds, I have estimated that I have won fifty thousand dollars in my life. You know David Longley. And then he paused for a minute and he said, I've also estimated that on these grounds I've lost $49,700. That's the way I relate. <laughs> okay, I, I, I hope that uh, you will take this Christmas Sunday School lesson away with you and make something happen out of it in your own lives. Uh, I would call this, in some respects, Sunday school life, in the sense that there's no real heavy message involved in this Sunday school lesson. But on the other hand, I, I don't want it to be Sunday school life. I want it to be Sunday school important for you and for me, okay? And so let's see what we can make out of this Sunday school lesson time we've got. I, I want to start off talking about Danish. Uh, but I'm not wanting to talk about the uh, Danish kind of food that we're aware of at this time of year especially. I, I have a, a client in Wisconsin that this time of the year, they always send me a, a, a Kringle. You all know what a Kringle is? A Kringle's a big old Danish about the size of the top of this podium. And it's got all kinds of sugar on top of it and all kind of little thin leaves of flowers and it's stuffed full of some kind of paste made out of uh, pecans. And, oh Lord, I mean, I have to police myself. I can sit down and eat that whole Danish <laughs> at one, one sitting. And so, I even have to be real careful because Phyllis wants that one to be a 50-50 deal. And so, uh, we have really been enjoying Kringle over the last couple of days. But that's not the kind of Danish that I'm interested in talking about. I'm interested in talking about a word that appears in the Danish language. Uh, that's a little bit unusual because most of us know that our language comes from the southern part of Europe and the Mediterranean area primarily and not from the uh, northern part of Europe or from the Scandinavian countries. And so there's not an awfully lot in our language that's derived from that particular world. But there is a Danish word that I want you to write down in your brains and I want it to become a part of your vocabulary, and I'd love for it to become a part of your life as I'm trying to make it a part of mine. And the Danish word is spelled H-Y-Y-G. 
G-E, H-Y-Y-G-E. Now, I would go around the room and we could have some fun letting you all uh, jump at the way that's pronounced. But I, I have learned the correct pronunciation, and the correct pronunciation is hew, like you would hew a log, or like someone's name, ga, hew ga, hew ga, hew ga. That's right, pretty word, hew ga. Okay, so that's what I want you to remember. Not the Danish Kringle that tastes so good, but the Danish word H-Y-Y-G-E pronounced huga, huga. Uh, it might be a little interesting for you to know that in the last two years, the people in the United Kingdom who do the Oxford English Dictionary uh, have determined that that word is the second most important word in the United Kingdom, new word, in the last two years. The first is Brexit. And boy, has that created a lot of confusion for those people. And that may be why they need a little cue God. Okay, let's define the word. Uh, the word in the Danish language means comfort. It means cozy. It means safety. It means equality. It means warmth. It means soul. It means mind. It means awareness that is achieved in a very special way, that is achieved by everyday togetherness. Now, you'll not be tested on that, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. Hugo means comfort and cozy and safe and soul and consciousness that is achieved by everyday togetherness. All right, now that you've got that down, let's back up a little bit. And let's back up a little bit etymologically. And what we find is that the oldest languages of that part of the world that we're aware of were called Old Norse languages, N-O-R-S-E, rhyming with Norse. And, and that meant language that came from the civilization that existed before Norway and the civilization that existed before the Normans who came to live on the uh, western coast of, of France. And in the Old Norse language, they had a very, very special word, and this word, Hugo, comes from it. They had the word, hug. And that word meant to embrace. And so our word, hug, doesn't come from the Romans, and doesn't come from the Greeks, and doesn't come from the Hebrews. It comes from the Old Norse language. And to hug or to embrace was looked upon them as an almost medicinal word because they believed that there were some circumstances in life in which nothing helped more than a hug. That there were some circumstances in life that a hug would outdo a gift, Take that to your grandchildren. <laughs> that a hug would outdo money. Take that to your grandchildren. Or that a hug would even outdo something to eat or to drink. That a hug, an embrace, was something that could make a huge amount of difference in your life. And so when these Danish people got a hold of that word, and when they understood how important a hug was, they began to think, would it be possible consciously and intensely to create environments that acted like a hug? Environments that could surround us and environments that could help us kind of push back the world a little bit and gain a little strength and maybe even a little better health and certainly a little bit of sanity. And so who God was an environment that would function in our lives like a hug functions in our lives. Now, if you think about it for just a moment, then that will make total sense to you. Because I want you to think about what it would have been like not to have been raised in southern Italy, 
or not to have been raised in Fort Lauderdale, or not to have been raised even in Chattanooga, but to have been raised somewhere in the northern part of Norway or the northern part of Denmark. Most of the time there would be an oppressive coldness in the air. Most of the time there would be an oppressive dampness in the air. Most of the time it wouldn't even really be good daylight. And so it would have been a very oppressive environment to live in. And if you study that part of the world historically, you know that it was a wilding kind of the world in which there was almost every day the threat of some kind of invader, the threat of some kind of powerful person that acted in belligerent ways, the threat of some kind of chaos that would occur. And so here these people were, and they were living in not really always kind climate or culture. They were living in a world in which there was a lot that was negative and a lot that was to fear. And they thought maybe sometimes a hug helps. Or they thought that maybe sometimes a who God helped. An environment in which people could feel safe and respected and cared for. An environment of soul. An environment of spirit. Who God was a word that advance the idea of the quality of life, not the quantity of life. That may be very important for us because we've created a world that's all about quantity so much. Maybe sometimes we need times that help us think more about constructing environments in which something of a great quality of life can embrace us and surround us because we have our own chaos and we have our own uncertainties, and we have our own troubles. What's this got to do with Christmas? I, I, I think it's got a lot to do with Christmas. I, I, I've been thinking a lot in the last three or four days, but maybe because of Christmas cards that have come our way, and uh, many of those cards have depictions of the nativity scene. Uh, or I've been thinking about uh, the nativity uh, scene a lot as we put up our Christmas stuff spreading out over the house that's been collected by us now for almost 52 years. My, my wife has four creches that she puts out. And I usually get them out of the box and I kind of study them and set them up and I like to make sure that there's no cracks anywhere that I might be responsible for. Uh, and then she comes back and rearranges them and makes them pretty. But I, I kind of get them out to start with. She's got one crash, which is our main one that sits in the entryway of our house. And, and she got that in Italy many, many years ago. Uh, that, that was an expensive crash, and, it, and it, it should have been because the colors that make that crash up and the real facial likenesses that are carried by the different characters, the perfect forms of the donkeys and the sheep and the cow, and then the beautiful Mary and Joseph that is rendered in the baby in the manger. I, I mean, when I get that crash set up and I just sit there and kind of look at it, it just kind of makes cold chills run up my back. We were in Mexico one time visiting uh, Estelle and Steve, and they took us downtown to a Christmas market in the, uh, uh, in the town where they uh, had their apartment. All fill us immediately, spite a crash. And so our second crash comes from Mexico. And it, it not only is beautiful in its craftsmanship and its colors, but it was something that we kind of got with Stephen Estelle. And so that gives it an extra kind of, of meaning. Uh, and, and our third crash came from East Lake, which seems like an odd place for a crash to come from. But there was this ancient little old man that was in that church down there when I was asked to go down there and serve for a year and shut the church down. And, and we stayed for four or five, and now the church is still going, Bishop. And, and so that, that was a pretty wonderful time. But there was an old man in that church that kind of stumbled in and stumbled out, never had much to say, and he had palsy or some kind of AOL, AOL disease. And, and Parkinson's, and so his hands just shook and trembled all the time. You wondered how he could get from one place to the other. And one Christmas, he brought us in a crash. 
And then there was a backstory that talked about how across his life he'd been a very successful man in Chattanooga, but it had been his hobby to do ceramics. And that his ceramics had become prized in that community and then among people that knew him. And as he kind of handed the box to me, he said, I can't do this anymore. But this was one of my favorites that was left. And I want you and your family to have it. And we put that crash out every Christmas. And it is sparkling white and gleams in the light. And I feel those chills go up my back again. And in one time, one place that we were out fooling around in Houston. I've been working all day and Phyllis has been out shopping all day. We always had this contest. Can I make them enough money in the day? She's actually a very frugal person, but that's kind of a joke. But at any rate, she came in one day and she found some stuff for the house and found some stuff for the kids and actually found something for herself, which she didn't do much of. And she said, and I found something for you. And it's this little box about this big. It's really colorful. And when you open the doors, there's the nativity scene. And if you went to our house right now, that's sitting right a foot from my head, right by my bedside table. And when I wake up every morning to turn off the alarm or maybe wake up before the alarm, I'm looking into the front of that really beautiful little crash. And the cold chills start again. And you see where the story's kind of going? I, I, I think that the Bible spends an awfully lot of time in the Gospels, not only talking to us about the birth of Jesus and the importance of that, but giving us a very vivid view of the environment that's created around the birth of Jesus. You ever thought about that? There is an awfully lot of detail in the New Testament about exactly where that place was, exactly what the surroundings looked like, exactly what kind of people were there, exactly what kind of animals were there. The Bible does a wonderful job painting a word picture for us that probably turns out to be a lot like those nativity scenes and those crashes that it is inspired. And now I've put those thoughts together. And in my head over the last little while, I've decided that maybe in that Bethlehem manger, for a few moments, what was created was who God. Maybe in a world that was about as chaotic a world as it could have been, a world in which most people were poverty stricken, a world in which there were Roman invaders, a world that had a lot of crime because it was right on the trade routes that went north, uh, east and west. Uh, a, a world in which people were being overwhelmed by unfair taxes and all kind of political agendas. A world in which most people were really dispossessed and uncertain about where their futures were going. For a moment in the midst of that, there was Hugo. For a moment in the midst of that, there was a nativity scene. For a moment in the midst of that, in probably what was like a barn half shed, there is something that happens that is qualitative. And it is quiet there. And it is easy there. And it is safe there. And it is cozy there. And it is comfortable there. And there is something of soul that is there. And something of spirit that is there. And at least for a little while, the chaos of the world is pushed back. And there is the quality of everyday togetherness that Mary and Joseph, all of these shepherds, and ultimately the wise men that will later come, experience because emanating at the center of that environment is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. For a moment, in the midst of a chaotic world, there is Uga, there is cozy, there is comfort, 
there is intimacy, there is safety, there is soul, there is spirit. And of course, where this all goes into our Christmas season is the challenge that we have to recreate anything that is like the qualitative spirit that existed in that manger at that nativity. The challenge that we have when our lives are daily bombarded by all of the news makers and news pundits and news fearful people and all of the people that are coming at us with economic agendas and political agendas and all kinds of foreign intrigue agendas. I mean, we just see a world that is filled with chaos. And sometimes we just add to that chaos by all of our shopping and buying and entertaining patterns, all of which are probably good enough and fine. But I wonder if it's possible for us to be able to have a pushing back a little bit or a pushing away a little bit of the chaos. And to be able in this holiday season to create moments at least of everyday together where we experience coziness and comfort and safety and soul and spirit. You know, I've even gotten to thinking that that should be at the heart of Christmas celebration. I've even gotten to thinking that that's probably what is aimed at in the heart of Hanukkah celebration. Kwanzaa celebrations or Ramadan celebrations because in all of these traditions with all of their differences and sometimes competing differences you've got people who need environments of safety and environments of comfort and environments of intimacy that can represent the best part of their life. Find a crash to stare into for a few moments over the next couple of weeks. And think about how an environment was created there that allowed the world to feel like that it was being hugged by God and His love. One of the oldest Christmas carols that we ever sing is God Rest You Merry Gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Wouldn't that be a miracle to chase dismay out of our lives a little bit? For unto you is born this day of Bethlehem a Savior. And how does that old Christmas carol end? With tidings of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. With tidings. And in recent studies completed by the United Nations, looking at nations across the world that are the happiest nations, Denmark, the Danish, come out number one. We're well down that list, by the way. And so maybe what we need at Christmas is a little pushing back of the chaos like they had in that manger. And the realization that that becomes possible because the light of life that is in that manger, God and His Son for us. Let us pray. We know, our Father, that we're going to run our lives the next couple of weeks at 1,000 miles an hour. We know that there's every kind of obligation, community, a commitment, and duty that we feel that we are the ones that have to be discharge. For most of us, there are still wreaths to be made and outside decorations to be complete and to make sure that that tree stays watered and to make sure that everybody's got the right gift. So we're going to be moving at 100 miles an hour. We realize, our Father, we live in a chaotic world. All we've got to do is turn on the news and we feel the tension heightened on the inside of our lives. So help us that we might be able to create in our lives some kind of space of everyday togetherness, some type of qualitative space that kind of turns its nose up at the quantitative world that we live in. 
and help us that in that every day togetherness that we might achieve a sense of comfort and joy and that we might achieve you God and that there might be a coziness and an intimacy and a comfort and a safety in our lives that we know somehow is why you sent Jesus to start with and the gift that you still want us to experience for we ask in his name Amen. Who got? So, who got?